When people see a Morgan out on the road, they tend to think of it as a classic car. It's a timeless car that looks like it was built 50 years ago. In fact, these cars are still being made the old-fashioned way, by hand at the Morgan factory. It's a story about refusing to bend to the whims of fashion. Today's Morgans are different from any other cars on the road. They hark back to a time when automobiles were handcrafted by artisans. Morgans are still built in a small, one-story set of workshops on Pickersley Road in Malvern Link, England. The automobile industry prides itself on being high-tech on the cutting edge of computer-aided design and manufacturing. Not Morgan. It attracts people who are looking for something unique. The company is more than a name. It's a family business, still controlled by the Morgans. Charles Morgan, grandson of the founder, is now in charge. Visitors come away knowing that his commitment to creating classic-looking cars is strong. Morgan is passionate about preserving the low-slung, sporty nature of his cars. Would you believe that the cars still use a wooden body frame? A coach-building technique handed down from the days of carriage builders. This is how Henry Morgan built his first cars in 1910. In many ways, little has changed. Henry Frederick Stanley Morgan was born in 1881. He was the studious son of a minister and was eventually accepted into an engineering college. His first car was a lightweight three-wheeler propelled by a seven-horsepower Peugeot engine. The first Morgan runabout had been born. Initially, there was no intention of marketing the vehicle, but he received enough favorable comments to persuade him to build a few. He raised some money, expanded the garage at Malvern Link, provided by his father, and began to build his Morgan three-wheelers. These spirited runabout three-wheelers were affordable at a time when cars were mainly for the rich. A three-wheeler, or cycle car, was only taxed as a motorbike. Sound engineering, good power-to-weight ratio, and innovative suspension made it attractive as a race car. Morgan won the first cycle car race at the Brooklyn's track in 1912 with an average speed of 57 miles per hour. Winning races helped to put Morgans in the limelight. Making them a two-seater made them more practical. People raced Morgans from the very beginning in 1910. Racing and winning events got a lot more factory orders, and so that's what really got sales going from 1910 onward. He advertised their success, and by 1914 was producing 1,000 three-wheel cycle cars a year. Morgan wasn't the only one making three-wheelers. The possibilities seemed endless. There were people who had them as daily drivers because with the Morgan three-wheeler, you can carry your sweetheart or your wife or a friend shopping or, you know, or to work or someplace else and enjoy it a lot more. Morgan's dream was interrupted by World War I. All car manufacturing stopped and his workshops, like all the other makers, were switched to war manufacturing. After the war, 
Morgan moved to a new factory in Morven Link on Pickersley Road, where it continues to produce cars today. There have been some changes inside, especially in the areas dedicated to building its newest car, the Aero 8. But much of the factory appears as it might have when Henry Morgan moved in and began to build three-wheelers more than three quarters of a century ago. Strong sales kept things humming. Its design made it popular, but eventually there were competitors to the three-wheel wonder. In 1923, the small four-wheel Austin 7 and Morris 8 began to make three-wheelers passé. But Morgan pressed on and continued to win races with its three-wheelers. But by the mid-1930s, it was clear that a four-wheel car was needed. In 1936, they introduced a car with four cylinders and four wheels, the 4-4. It also became a successful competitor, but by the end of World War II, sports cars were experiencing a revolution. Cars like the Jaguar XK120 were turning heads and winning races. Morgan followed the beat of a very different drummer. It clung to its classic styling while improving the car's power and handling. With a shortage of hard currency at home, the pressure was on to find export markets. The elegant 4.4 and Plus 4 found willing buyers abroad, but the three-wheelers did not. The cars that started the company were discontinued in 1950. At home, the influence of Italian styling was catching on among other sports car builders. Donald Healy commissioned a sleek new car that was less expensive than the XK120, but offered beautiful styling and solid performance. Some pressured Morgan to follow this route, but others, like MG, were sticking to their classic approach. Finally, in 1955, even MG succumbed to marketing pressures and introduced a sleeker, more modern roaster. The launch of the MGA left Morgan the last builder of traditional sports cars. The traditional methods continued at Pickersley Lane. Ash was still hand-shaped and transformed into coachwork, just as when Morgan made his first car. The cars have always been ideally suited to meandering along English country roads, but it became clear that more performance was needed to navigate American freeways. Its four-cylinder engine came from the Standard Company, which was run by the man who helped Henry Morgan with his first set of patent drawings. Standard had a new engine designed for its Vanguard sedan, and wanted to use it in its own sports car. They wanted to compete with MG and other British companies who were having success exporting to the US. They put an updated Vanguard engine in their new Triumph TR2 in 1954. The enhanced engine gave the TR2 90 horsepower. It was also made available to Morgan. This helped Morgan to continue to grow its customer base in America. These drivers wanted something different to cars being offered by American companies. Part of the car's appeal was price. A Morgan could be bought in the UK for about 800 pounds, including taxes. But changes were coming. The tradition of carrying two spare tires vanished as a cost-saving measure. New owners would have to get by with one spare.
the company heard that its American customers wanted larger interiors. They widened the cockpit by shrinking the width of the running boards. For some, the biggest change was the radiator. The traditional flat radiator, or flat rad, was hidden beneath more aerodynamic curved bodywork. This hand-formed radiator shape is still seen on today's classic Morgans. Other carryover features that were new in the mid-1950s were the enclosed headlights. Some thought these were radical changes, but Morgans retained their old-world style and charm. This is what people wanted. It still is. These fans live for events like the one held at the historic Road America track in Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin, in the summer of 2004. These Morgan loyalists form MOGs, or Morgan Owners Groups. They come together to celebrate their unique vehicles. This passion is shared in Morgan's birthplace. The UK MOG held its 2004 event in Oswestry, an ancient market town close to the Welsh border. The MOG displayed its cars on the showgrounds below the site reputed to be the birthplace of Queen Guinevere. These get-togethers give people a chance to learn Morgan's history something the family cares a lot about. It was a significant day in 1958 when HFS Morgan handed over the reins to his son Peter. Peter vowed to maintain the Morgan tradition of building handcrafted sports cars. He knew that more and more high-performance sports cars were coming to market but he was determined to protect the purity of the Morgan image and his approach to building cars. His son Charles shares that commitment today. I think the, the Morgan Motor Company is regarded as a very traditional company that doesn't change things very often. Um, and that's probably true, that the company only changes things when it's really necessary. But the Morgan Company had to worry about the threat posed by sports cars coming to market from all parts of the globe. Porsche in Germany had created a following with its sleek and modern cars. As had the Corvette in America and the sporty Thunderbird. Peter Morgan struggled with finding a way to compete with the manufacturing strength of Detroit and the engineering prowess of the Germans. Morgan still had high quality craftsmanship and the kind of driving experience that originally drew people to sports cars. Combine this with outstanding performance and that might be enough to maintain a niche in the market. They would have to keep up with technology without losing the qualities that made a Morgan a Morgan. Charles Morgan still wrestles with these needs today. I think the traditional Morgan appeals to people because of its purity of design and simplicity. Um, it really is what a sports car is about in a sense. You can see where the engine is, it's under that long bonnet. Um, you can see the wheel, the spare wheel on the back. You can, uh, you can see that the cockpit is a bit like an aeroplane cockpit and you can imagine sitting in it and, uh, and driving along a, a road in the countryside, almost communing with nature like you're on a, a motorbike as much as in a car. And for that reason, the, the, the style has never died. It's a little bit like a cricket bat, you know, you can't reinvent it. This philosophy of building timeless cars also guided the company in the 1960s. Tradition was strong at the factory. Many of the workers were second and third generation employees. They often stayed on for years. The factory was run like a craft guild composed of apprentices and master craftsmen. 
Well, I started as an apprentice in 1955, and I worked myself up through the ground hike and got where I wanted to do. Now it's time for me to retire. I worked here 45 years. I started in 1959. So, had a few changes over the years, but not many. <laughs> This long-term loyalty is increasingly rare in the automotive world. The reliance on artisans for building cars is now only seen at Morgan, and some of the super luxury cars and exotic sports cars, which are more costly. By the mid-1960s, the adherence to its traditional labor-intensive ways meant that Morgan could no longer be billed as inexpensive. It became a costly, though not astronomically priced, sports car. For the money, buyers received something that set them apart. The car's unique charms continued to find favor around the world. But Peter Morgan decided he wanted to try something a little different. In 1963, he exhibited the Plus 4 Plus at the Earl's Court Motor Show. This was wholly unexpected and caused a stir. The fully enclosed glass fiber bodied two-seater used a strengthened Plus 4 chassis with a 105 horsepower TR4 engine. The car was very successful in time trials, but it didn't ignite the passions of Morgan enthusiasts. The existing Morgan customers certainly weren't impressed, and I think the problem with new customers are you're then in a market where you're competing with all sorts of other cars, and there were MGs and Triumphs and, and you know, all sorts of other cars, and this was a bit more expensive than, than some of the competitors, and it just basically didn't sell. After only two years, production of the Plus 4 Plus was discontinued. Only 26 were built, many of which were brought to Oswestry. The cars are clearly admired by their current owners. It's a very special car because it is so rare. There are only eight, I think, in England. So whenever you go out driving in it, um, people stop and uh, ask you questions and, and uh, get very excited about it. I've even had people slow down alongside me on the motorway and wind down the window and they say, what the hell is that? And so it's, uh, it's nice to have something really special. Most Morgan lovers wanted cars with leather straps across the bonnet, full fenders, running boards, and an open cockpit that gave them the feel of the road. I think we're all slightly eccentric or, you know, gluttons for punishment, as we say back home, that, you know, yeah, well, we could have a, a heater system that works, we could have an air conditioning that works, but we don't want that. We want to get our head bent and feel the rain in your hair, and this is the theory behind the Morgan, is we commute in it during the week, and on a weekend, we just throw the, 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 the racing suit on and go racing. But by 1966, it was becoming necessary to once again upgrade the engine if the company was going to continue to attract buyers interested in performance. They turned to the Rover company and licensed its aluminum V8 engine. The new Plus 8 model was unveiled at the Earl's Court show in 1968. The new, more powerful engine, now under the hood of the lightweight car, increased its driving excitement. The Plus 8 was soon turning up at leading sports car races. It showed its racing pedigree when the cars began to win championships, including the British Sports Car Championship in 1978. It won this crown after attaining nine wins and three seconds in 12 races. This was followed by another championship the next year. Piloting the cars was Rob Wells and the founder's grandson, Charles Morgan. While the engine could be modified to meet the increasingly stringent European emission standards, 
it wasn't deemed suitable for the US market. Morgan withdrew from this vital North American territory in 1973. It was years before it returned. And during this time, Germany became the number one export country for the company. German buyers kept Morgan Plus 8s rolling out of the Pickersley Lane factory. This helped the company weather the period when it was no longer selling cars in the US. Work began on a new car that would eventually be sold in the US, while taking Morgan into the next century, the Aero 8. This would be a breakthrough car. Its hand-formed superform aluminum body, from the same company that supplies Aston Martin and Bentley, would be mated with the latest drivetrain and safety gear. These low and swoopy cars were ready to hit the road in February of 2000, when first shown to the public at the Geneva Motor Show. I think Charles Morgan really wanted uh, a clean uh, start over car, a new platform, and brought a car that has a bonded, riveted aluminum space frame, uh, a modern uh, BMW motor, uh, air conditioning, uh, power window lifts, as they call them. Uh, it's still not overburdened with too many creature comforts, it's got just enough. The company began entering the Aero 8 in notable races like the 24 Hours of Le Mans in 2002, and at the Belgian Grand Prix circuit at Spa, and at Sebring in Florida. Once again, racing helped to ignite public interest in Morgan. Unfortunately, the cars wouldn't make it to the US for several years. We drove along with Charles Morgan, who was happy to get his hands on one of the cars eventually destined for the US. Well, this is quite interesting for me. Um, it's one of the first drives I've had in the American Aero. Um, I notice a few things immediately, which is that the steering is very direct, um, but it's very light. It's nice. It's got a very nice feel to it. Um, the gearbox is, is very, um, very light. The clutch is light. Um, but you have got this enormous reserve of power if you want it. The Aero 8 was finally introduced to the US market in January 2004. It had been years since an all-new Morgan could be bought from a factory franchise dealer. There was pent-up demand for the cars. Some couldn't wait to go racing. The Aero 8s became exciting crowd pleasers at sports car events. The drivers loved to go head-to-head -head in their new cars. Eventually, a revived classic would come back, but for the time being, the Aero 8 would be Morgan's face in North America. It didn't matter if you wanted to go racing or head out on the road. The Aero 8 was sure to deliver a large dose of driving excitement. While the first Aero 8s had cockpits that were a bit cramped and a little noisy, the car gave drivers something that all its predecessors had, fun. All Morgan sports cars, whether they be the classic or the new Aero 8 with its latest technology, is about the, 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 the pleasure and enjoyment that you can get out of driving. It's hard to look at any Morgan today without thinking of the little factory at Pickersley Lane and the people that build these cars just as they were built in 1910, one by one and by hand.